Okay, great. Um, I'm delighted to see you all here today. Um, I'm Denise Mauserl, a professor um, joined between the CPREED um, Center for Policy Research and Energy and Environment, the Woodrow Wilson School, and the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Tobias Schmidt from ETH Zurich, who's visiting us here today from Switzerland and on his way to some meetings in Colorado. He's currently an assistant professor of energy politics and the head of the energy politics group at ETH Zurich. He's unusual in that he combines strong technical training, holding a master's degree in electrical engineering from the Technical University of Munich, with a PhD from ETH in management technology and economics, with a focus on improving understanding of technological innovation, institutional dynamics, and organizational strategies as drivers of decarbonization of the economy. So in a sense, he's, he's like the people we are trying to train or are ourselves in CPRI, someone with a strong technical background doing policy relevant um, research. Uh, he's been a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Precourt Energy Efficiency Center and has been a consultant to UN development program working on their de-risking renewable energy investment uh, project. I have to say he's an enormously prolific scholar with multiple papers in the past few years in science, nature, nature energy, nature climate change, nature communications, <coughs> as well as other high impact disciplinary journals like applied energy, energy policy, climate policy, and environmental research letters. His papers include work on technology as a driver of climate energy politics, the roles of state and multilateral investment banks in low carbon energy finance, cost efficient battery storage of electricity, and broadly, an analysis of financing sustainable energy transitions. I have to say his work has inspired people in my group and has been really influential in some of the work that some of the graduate students in my group are, are doing. To tell, today he'll tell us more about his research on accelerating the clean energy transition. Please join me in welcoming Professor Schmidt. Uh, thanks a lot, Denise. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to uh, present um, on my research. It's not going to be the classic I present one paper presentation, but this is going to be kind of a, uh, a tour across a lot of papers, which are all combined in one framework. Um, so I'm at ETH Zurich, which is here in the middle of this, of this uh, slide, not to be confused with the University of Zurich, which is there. Um, who of you knows ETH Zurich? Who of you has heard of that before this talk? Okay, so quite a bit. Um, I'm always saying it's the, the least, no, least renowned uh, top school in the world. Um, so I'm doing this. I'm running this survey um, whenever I give a talk, by the way. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about accelerating the clean energy transition. And I think in order to understand the clean energy transition, you have to understand three things. You have to understand policy and the underlying politics. You have to understand technology and the underlying supply chains and value chains. And you have to understand uh, finance. And I'm, I'm going to talk about those three things. Um, and I'm going to integrate them into um, our research framework, which I'll present in a minute. And then I'll deep dive into each of those streams. One is on technological change, and it's particularly the idea of designing what's, what I call technology smart policy. And I'm going to talk about finance and how to catalyze private capital at low cost for clean technologies. And then I'm going to talk about politics um, and the feedback from technological change on politics. And then I'm going to wrap it up with three, three high-level policy messages from those three research streams. I, I hope I, it's OK if I skip um, all the relevance part, why we need a clean energy transition, why we need it fast. Um, I hope everyone in the room understands that. So um, good, I hear, I hear, I see a lot of fingers, I see a lot of nodding. Um, so let's jump right into the, into the research framework. So I'm really, um, as many others arguing, that technological change, so the innovation, invention, and diffusion of new technologies in the phase out of incumbent polluting technologies is one of the key, if not the key lever to address climate change and other um, issues around the natural environment. Um, of course, behavioral change is also important, but I think technological change certainly is um, a key lever here. So we're interested in technological change. And we're particularly interested in how policy can accelerate technological change. So what are the policy effects? And of course, policy doesn't come out of the blue, but there is politics involved. So we also include that in our framework. So we're interested in those policy dynamics, the politics of energy policy or climate policy, if you wish. And then what we're really interested in in that part is also the feedback from technological change. So if you build a clean, clean energy industry, for instance, how can that alter 
political dynamics. Um, our research group mostly focuses on electricity generation, storage, and the grid, but also a bit on transport and energy efficiency in buildings. Um, the focus on the electricity sector has a couple of reasons. One, it's the biggest, pollute, biggest contributor to climate change as a sector. It's also arguably the solution, right? I mean, only a clean electricity sector um, can, or makes, it only, electric, electric mobility, for instance, or electric vehicles only makes sense if you have a clean electricity sector. And I'm also, I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm a bit biased. Um, in terms of regions, we really have a global outlook. We do a lot of stuff on OECD countries, um, but also quite a lot on developing countries. Um, and um, yeah, we have all kind of, we're, we're really question driven, so we're not a methodology or theory group. Um, we apply whatever fits the problem that we're looking at best. Um, and as this is an interdisciplinary framework, uh, my research uh, lab is also interdisciplinary, so um, we have essentially three types of people. We have engineers who don't want to work as engineers anymore, but who understand technology. Um, we have economists, particularly focusing on finance, and we have political scientists in the group. So with that framework, and I'm going to use this framework to guide you through all of these three research streams. So let's get started with uh, technological change and this idea of technology smart policy. And I hope I can convey what I mean by that. Um, so I think um, this, of course, fits into this part of the framework. Already explained what technological change is, the in invention, innovation, diffusion of technologies. I'm not going to go into the details. Here are some, some of the papers that we published. So big question I want to pose here um, is we see uh, a lot of policies thrown at technologies, and then we observe very different outcomes. And one example is, for instance, China's attempt of catching up in renewable energy, which was highly successful in the case of PV. Right? They took over the global um, photovoltaics industry within two, three years, between like 2009 to 2011. But in the case of wind, there's hardly any Chinese turbines outside of China. Right? They've grown their industries, but there's no export or hardly any export yet. Why is that the case? But they, for both um, technologies, it really threw a lot of policies at them, really a lot of subsidies. Let's have a look at these two technologies. What you see here on the left-hand side is so-called patent citation networks. So patents cite each other like papers do. So if you build on a previous patent, you have to cite that patent. And that means you can build citation networks. And what you see here on the top is the solar PV citation networks. And that's really the, of course, there's many more of this, like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 patents on solar PV, of course. But these are really the top patents on that path. So they are the dominant path that explain how the technology evolved. And you see the same here for wind. And on this uh, y-axis here, this is time, and on the y-axis you actually see um, the content of the patent, okay? And in the colors, white means it's a product patent, and gray means it's a process, a manufacturing process patent. And without looking at all the details here, you see a striking difference between the two technologies, right? So the top, you see in the beginning, yeah, there were some product patents around the cell, essentially, and a bit about the module. But then it really all switched to manufacturing of the cell. And that essentially is what made solar PV cheap. Whereas when you look at wind, you really can see this, um, this evolution from first patenting or innovation invention around the rotor. Is it like a two blade or three blade or five blade turbine? Once this was kind of um, resolved, three blades, <laughs> we moved to the powertrain gearbox, what kind of gearbox, how do we actually control um, the speed of the turbine, um, how do we make sure it's synchronous with, this, with, the, with the grid, and there was a lot, there was a lot of patenting here. Um, so then pitch control, that's the, the, the system that was then, um, that emerged, and then we moved down and down and down in this product architecture. So it's very different patterns, right? Also, if we look at the, um, necessity of intersectoral learning because again these technologies are produced in supply chains and one firm does not know everything if we look 
add supply chain. Here you see a generic supply chain from material supply, manufacturing of um, the good, integration or project development, all the way to end use. If you look at how important um, the intersectoral learning, interaction between sec uh, actors of different sectors is, this is very interesting. For solar PV, it's really upstream. It's a lot between the cell manufacturer and the material supplier, and especially um, the production equipment suppliers. Um, for wind, it's really downstream. There's a lot of interaction, especially with the end user. And for lithium-ion, it's up and downstream. And then there's some, some interaction which is necessary for all. So why is this the case? Why do we see so different innovation patterns? And our argument is this is because of a technology inherent characteristic. And that characteristic is the locus of complexity. Where is complexity in the supply chain? And there's two important loci of complexity. One is the complexity of the design of a technology. So that refers to the number of design elements, the number of components, if you want to simplify, of a technology, and how they're interrelated. So if there's a lot of inter interaction between them, if you change one component, the design of one component, and you have to adjust an, a lot of other components, that means that's a compl complex design. And the other thing is the complexity of the manufacturing process, meaning are there many production steps and how interrelated are they? Do I have to change a lot of other production steps if I change one of them? Right? And we say they can be pretty much independent. And if you locate technologies here, you could say, hey, there's these complex design intensive technologies like wind turbines, right? lots of parts. And there, if you change the blade, you have to change your, your powertrain. You have to change a lot of things. Um, geothermal power would fit here, concentrated solar, large hydro. These are all design-intensive technologies. Whereas down here, you have these manufacturing-intensive technologies, mass-manufactured goods, essentially, where you have very complex manufacturing processes. For instance, in photovoltaics, if you change one um, manufacturing step, if you just adjust it slightly, you have to change up to 700 other steps. And you don't necessarily know exactly how to change them from the beginning. So there's a lot of trial and error in manufacturing there. And then you have these dually complex technologies like, for instance, lithium-ion batteries, which are complex, which have components that interact a lot, and it's not necessarily clear how they interact, and that are produced in very complex manufacturing processes. And then you, of course, have simple technologies like, you know, solar cook stuffs, which are, you know, very simple in terms of design compared to these other technologies. All relative, of course, and of course, um, not, don't, do not require you know, mass manufacturing, long production lines. So if you think about this matrix, this matrix has implications. First of all, for how innovation patterns play out. So first of all, the further you go away from this zero here, the more you need experimentation to learn. Right? You can't just do something from in the lab and then once you understood it in the lab, it will work. But you need really feedback from experimentation with the manufacturing process or the design. And here, exactly, this is the experimentation with the full-scale product. When do you think you know, when you, when you design a new wind turbine, typically means a bigger wind turbine, right? That's the trend in the industry. When you design that and you do all your, your labs, or you do all your simulations and AutoCAD and so on, when do you think you know the average efficiency of that turbine? It's once you built this turbine and it's operating at full scale. When do you think you know the efficiency range of that turbine across different wind speeds? That's when you went through, at least in Europe, three winters. That's when you may have the storms with a lot of turbulence and so on with an entire fleet of turbines. It's really unpredictable, so you need experimentation with this product. And all the tacit knowledge is in the design. So it's in the brains of the designers. Whereas here, you need experimentation with full-scale production. So really a full factory. And once you have that, you can improve that uh, factory and you can improve the equipment. And that's also where the tacit knowledge is. It's in the manufacturing equipment. 
that already answers the question why China <laughs> had a hard time catching up here. Because you really need, un un unless you can transfer a lot of engineers to your country um, or to your firm, it's really hard for you to catch up, right? Whereas here, all you need to do is buy the latest manufacturing equipment. You will have the, the cheapest sell. Whoever has the, um, the latest manufacturing equipment and finances this cheaply can actually offer the cheapest solar cell and can outcompete anybody else. Um, it also has very important policy implications. So first of all, um, innovation policy, the further away you go from the zero, requires demand pull. So really um, driving or creating a market for these technologies so that we have, that, that we enable experimentation with product or process. For the technologies, the further you go up, the more important is user feedback. So geographical proximity to a market is important. This really explains this big home market advantage. And this home market doesn't even have to be big. What is important is that it's stable. Think about Denmark. Denmark invests us, still the biggest producer of wind turbines. Denmark is not a huge country, right? There's not a huge home market. But there, is, there was a stable home market that they could really bank on. What is really important if you want to transfer tested knowledge, you really actually have to transfer people. By the way, that's how Korea caught up is one of the factors how Korea really successfully caught up in lithium ion batteries from Japan. They hired a lot of retired Japanese engineers, actually the most experienced with the most tacit knowledge. And then in terms of finance here, financial um, or policy, what you want, if you want to intervene here, you should reduce the cost of capital of the project owners. So let's say the wind farm owners or the solar park owners. And that can be done through project finance de-risking, for instance. And that was, for instance, the German feed-in tariff um, they gave a guaranteed price, so that was, you know, made, made banks uh, more willing to lend at lower cost. I'll get back to that in the finance part. And then finally, if, you, if you're interested in supporting these kind of technologies and localizing them, um, you need large and increasing global markets. It doesn't matter where you sell it to, right, because you don't need user feedback. Home market advantage doesn't play out. But increasing markets because the learnings in the equipment. And if you just have stable markets, you won't need new equipment until the equipment is worn out, which only takes place like every, say, five to 10 years. But if you have increasing markets, you need new equipment. And that means there's, there's more um, demand for innovative equipment. Um, what's also important is that policy should incentivize continuous cost reductions here. For instance, reduce subsidies over time to keep the innovation pressure high. What you also definitely need is unrestricted transfer of capital goods the manufacturing equipment. Um, and in terms of finance, here it's really important to reduce the cost of capital of the, um, of the manufacturers. And that's exactly what China did. Um, there was a loan program um, for cell producers in China, and they could lend from that at very low cost. And that's how you outcompete right away the existing PV industry. OK, so the big policy message here is innovation policy should consider these technology inherent differences and therefore be designed in what I call technologies in a technology smart way. So that's the first uh, message and that's the first research stream. Already mentioned finance a bit, let's move on. Um, let's deep dive into this topic a bit. And here the big question is in uh, UN Secretary General always calls it, how do we get from the billions to the trillions, right? If you look at the integrated assessment models, um, what they uh, project in terms of investment demand um, for clean energy um, and, and, and low carbon technology is one to four trillion dollars a year over the next 30 years. That might sound like a lot, lot. But on the other hand, if you only look at institutional investors, so pension funds, insurance companies, they manage around more than 80 trillion. So it's, if you put this in perspective, it's, it's not that much. We will still be able to build hospitals and stuff. Um, but the big question is how can, you, how can you get a lot of private capital at low cost? Because one to four trillion will be hard if we only do it through public finance. Um, and if we have a high price bill on that capital, then that will also slow down the energy transition, right? Um, 
so this is really, in this framework, this is really focusing on this middle part and especially on this question of how to finance new assets, which is particularly important for technological change, of course. An important question is, how do we finance our energy system in the first place? And that's pretty interesting. Like, in the past, historically, we financed that through balance sheets of utility companies, right? Especially when we talk about electricity. So essentially, um, if you're an investor and you lend to those utilities, you um, lend to their portfolio of power plants, of assets. But what we see now um, recently, more and more in renewable energy is so-called project finance. And that's very different. Project finance means Wind Farm X is its own legal entity. So they're often called SPV, Special Purpose Vehicle. And if you lend to that special purpose vehicle, to that legal entity, and let's say that legal entity goes bankrupt, you don't see your money back. You cannot, whereas if that wind farm was part of a big portfolio, right, you would still see your money because these other assets would generate enough income. So that's a big, big step. By the way, that's huge in Europe, but also in the US. A lot of project finance. Now, what we wanted to understand is how do these, and project finance is essentially, it's mostly done in developing countries historically because you don't want to contaminate your balance sheet with risky projects in developing countries, so you make it its own legal entity, right? It's very expensive because think about it, one wind farm, let's say a big wind farm like in the US, 50 to 100 million investment, to have an analyst look at that, that's very expensive. Those guys at, in Zurich downtown, they earn a lot of money, those bankers and the, and the lawyers. Um, whereas if you have a you know, multi-billion um, portfolio, that's not as expensive. It's not as expensive in terms of transaction cost. Now, um, we wanted to understand how do, these, how do these financing conditions change for renewable energies, right? Because we want to understand, hey, what's the price tag on capital? Does that, does that, is that high or low, and, and, and how does that develop? So we really want to understand how and why did solar PV and wind onshore financing conditions change over time. And if we see um, differences or uh, developments, what's the effect of these changes on electricity generation costs? And we did this in four steps. Um, for, and the most important one is the first. Nobody has this data, right? Because this is um, financing data is, of course, sensitive. If your competitor knows how you finance your wind farm, um, that's not good for you, right? Because then you can go, um, you could better go to your bank and ask for the same conditions. So what we did is we um, did, um, surveyed, I mean, we talked to um, 42 investors that cover um, 85 and 80% of the wind onshore investment between 2000 and 2017 in Germany. Um, so I could say all the important guys are in our sample. And we asked them to give us, our, give us their past data, because that's not that sensitive anymore. And also, of course, on you know, the base of Chatham House rules and so on, we anonymize everything and so on. Um, and then we got 133 um, representative PV and onshore wind projects over the last 18 years. And here's the first result. So this is time. In red, you see the cost of debt. And in blue, you see the cost of equity. Um, and some of them only gave us their weighted average cost of capital. And you can clearly see this downward trend. Amazingly steep, actually. Right? From in 2000, you would pay like 6, 7% on your, on your, on your debt and, and over 10% on your equity for solar PV. And now it's down to somewhere, you know, for debt, 1, 2%. Actually, there's many more points here. And, and like, I don't know, 4 or 5% for your equity. That's a lot of reductions if you look at this. Um, at the early times compared to the, to the late times, it's 70% reduction um, for PV on the weighted average uh, uh, cost of capital and about 60% um, for wind. But is that correct for the, the general downturn of interest rates? Next slide. No, two slides ahead. You're two slides ahead, not only one. So the first thing is we wanted to understand what, what drives this, right? Why do we see this, this strong downward trend? And one of, the, one of those drivers is essentially what you just said, and that's an economic, uh, the, at the general economy level, it's actually an ex exogenous shock, you could argue, 
and that was the financial crisis, which um, led to um, what's called quantitative easing of, this, of the European Central Bank, which is kind of the same as the Fed in the US. So they actually reduced the, in the US it would be the LIBOR, in Europe it's the EURIBOR, so how they lend money to banks. And also they bought large amounts of um, corporate bonds, so it was really easy to get money, essentially. So that's one effect. On top of that, um, there was a lot of development and experience build up in the renewable energy se uh, sector. So first of all, there was much more availability of performance data of plants, right? If you, if you build out a lot of wind capacity, over time you'll have great data on the performance of those plants, but also on, in, in terms of the wind resource. Actually, every wind turbine is also a measurement of the wind resource, right? So that reduced the uncertainty. Um, technological reliability went up just due to innovation. And um, then also there was policy um, experience. And then within the renewable energy financing industry, so within those banks and so on, um, there was a lot of learning by doing in there. So they built up um, renewable energy teams, which they didn't have before. And if, if they financed the first wind farm, they didn't know how to do the risk assessment, how to do the due diligence, but over time they got really efficient at that, right? Um, the investment ecosystem built up, there was standardized um, procedures, you know, things got much faster, contracts, partner networks built out and so on. And because this technology was performing better and better and all of everybody perceived it well, it was more and more investors were willing to enter this market. Meaning there was more and more competition and that always, you know, puts a pressure on the margins of those banks and financiers. So um, that also led to reduction. And if you, if you look at this, you could say, hey, this is really a driver related to general economic development. This is really exogenous to the renewable energy industry. But all of this below this line is really endogenous, right? This is endogenous to renewable energy sector. And this is even endogenous to the renewable energy financing sector, just a sub part of that sector. So we said, hmm, all of these things, they really remind us of technological learning, right? This experience building up, you get more efficient, you have more reliability, da, da, da. And that is reflected empirically in experience curves, right? You probably have all these seen these curves for photovoltaic um, cells, how they become much, 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 much cheaper. And if you log the, the, the cost, the specific cost per watt, say, um, over the um, logged capacity, you always have the straight line, more or less. That's this, it's called Wright's Law. So with every doubling of capacity, of cumulative capacity, you have a certain reduction, which is called the, the learning rate. And then we said, hey, why don't, why don't we do that also for finance? If, if these factors really look the same. So let's test, let's do a statistical test. And we did this and we find an experience rate of about 11% um, for the margins. This is only the margins. So what comes on top of how they refinance. Um, um, so with every doubling of investment sum, the margin of the bank goes down by 10%. We actually also see stat statistically significant effects on two other um, financing conditions. One is loan tenor, so how long do you lend? That went up dramatically in this period. Actually now they're lending almost for the entire project lifetime. Like if the project lifetime is 20 years, they're lending up to 18 years. In the beginning it was like nine or 10. And also what's called the um, debt service cover coverage ratio, but I'm not gonna go into that unless you uh, ask later. Um, and if you if we use these learning rates to then estimate these effects, you can see, hey, um, the cost, the, the, the debt margin here for solar went down from 2.5 to about 1% and from wind from 2.1 to about 1.1%. That's really low. And this comes on top of how they, how the banks themselves um, refinance. And here is the, so the general interest rate level, 10-year government bond as a good proxy. And here's exactly what the effect that you, Bob, mentioned before. Like pre-crisis, we started about here, and that was actually like this before. <laughs> so if I, I had shown the longer graph, this would look like this, and suddenly it goes down within a couple of years, especially, especially after 2008, right, when the financial crisis hits. It was actually negative for a short time, so we would have to pay money to the German government to, park, uh, to lend them money. Um, now, this is actually, nobody, hardly any modeler had, had, had uh, thought about this. 
And if you look at these dramatic reductions in the generation cost of those two technologies, for instance, solar coming down from about 500 in Germany to 67 um, uh, dollars per megawatt hour here, a lot of people say, oh, it's just because of technological change. But a lot of this is also the financial imp the, the improvements in terms of the financing. And especially in wind, this makes up, like the pure financing part, actually 24% of the reductions that we have observed in the LCOE, in the levelized cost of electricity generation. Now you could ask, OK, this is not likely to go up again, right? Because it's a learning curve. So it's just going to go flatter, flatter, flatter. But what happens if this picks up again? It doesn't look like it necessarily now. Um, but until recently, a lot, of, a lot of analysts expected this. And we have another paper out um, recently that actually uh, looks at that. And it's, it's not good news. So um, if, we, if we go to pre-crisis levels within the next five years, which is a bit extreme, wind could get up to 25% more expensive. Even if we go only to half pre-crisis levels, it would, go up, it would become 10% more expensive. And that t considers continuous technological learning. Wind is not that, uh, PV is not that much affected. If we go to half of pre-crisis levels, um, we would, would essentially kind of level out the technological learning and stay constant in terms of the cost. So that's, that's something that should not be over, uh, overlooked. Um, what should also not be overlooked is this financial sector learning. I mean, our, all of our models assume um, or the, what's called efficient market hypothesis, right? Capital markets are perfectly efficient. As soon as there's a new technology, they know exactly how to uh, price the capital that they lend to those te new technologies. Ah, apparently not. If we find statistically significant um, experience rates in the sector. By the way, there are even, we even find uh, investor fixed effect um, uh, significant rates. Um, so you can even see how the investors actually learn. Um, so that's something that policy should consider. And it's good news in a way because it says, hey, the climate change mitigation cost of new technologies might become lower once those financiers become more you know, experienced with those technologies. That's a, a, a learning factor that we often overlook or thus far have overlooked in our modeling. But again, also keep in mind the, the general interest rate, right, which is also largely overlooked in models. Um, now, another, another question that we were thinking about, hey, can we accelerate this learning? Right? Can we accelerate the banks and uh, yeah, essentially banks and other uh, debt sponsors wi being willing to lend to new technologies, new clean technologies? And what we looked at is the roles of what's called green state investment banks on the clean energy transition. And we looked at three of those, the, the KFW, which is not really a green investment bank, but it's just the German development bank. Sounds weird, but Germany had a development bank after the World War, Second World War. Actually, this is fully financed by US, US Marshall funds. And then it was so successful that it never, it was always, you know, repaying. And it was so successful that it was never abandoned, despite Germany being reconstructed, trust me. Um, and then the Green Investment Bank in the UK, which was founded in 2012 um, as part of the Climate Change Act in the UK, and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which is a similar uh, policy tool in Australia, also founded in 2012. And we wanted to understand what's the roles of these, of these um, banks. And we did 56 interviews with investors, project developers, lead arrangers, and essentially also these banks. And our hypothesis was really okay. Most of the, the important role, the most important role is capital provision and de-risking, right? That's what the, also the efficient market hypothesis was tell you. Um, so, Direct funding for crucial gaps where nobody would finance and de-risking instruments like guarantees. Like, you know, a new bi biomass project and they would say, hey, commercial bank X, if you finance this, we'll give you a guarantee. So if this project fails, you, we will repay you, okay? That's a classic de-risking tool. But then we find also other instrument, uh, other instrument, uh, other interesting roles, sorry. And one has to do exactly with what I told before in this other paper, and that is an educational role. In Australia, in, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what the interviews told, interviewees told us, if you did a solar project in 2012 or 2013 in Australia, that was ooh, highly innovative. And banks were not you know, familiar with this technology and were not willing to lend, um, which from a European perspective is a bit funny because that's already when we started consolidating our industry. Um, 
But they, and they, one of the problems was they did not know how to assess risks. They didn't have the risk assessment tools. They didn't have the due diligence processes and so on. So they helped those banks educate them. And they were really specialists. And they had in-house expertise. That's really interesting. They had internal engineers. Banks don't have engineers. They don't know what they're investing in, really, typically. But these guys do. The European Investment Bank, also a state or multilateral bank, a public sector bank, has 300 in-house engineers because they want to understand what they're investing. Um, then they have a very important early mover role or first or early mover role. And that's very important to overcome a very classic catch-22 in finance. And that is, mm, if you talk to any project developer, they're all like, oh, we have great projects in the pipeline. But I don't find any bank that finances it. And then if you talk to a bank, they say, oh, we have so much capital. We really want to invest in those projects, but they're all not bankable. So there's really this mismatch because they don't like to invest in new stuff. Banks always want track record. They like to invest in a wind farm that uses the, the, the wind turbine that has, you know, that's, that's, that's deployed already 10,000 times and you know, has a lot of track record. And they have data on that then. They don't like it if somebody proposes a wind project with a new generation of wind turbines that has no track record. So these guys can finance them, show that the technology works. Also, new developers, new players in the market, banks don't like that. They can also provide track record to those new players and therefore overcome this catch-22. And finally, this was really um, also interesting that they really have this big signal ring role. They're really seen as the experts in the sector. And we've seen projects in the UK and Australia where the project developer told us, I had this project, I wanted to get finance, nobody wanted to give me finance. No bank wanted to touch my project. Then the state investment bank came in said, yeah, we're going to finance this. Who wants to co-finance? Who of you public, uh, private sector banks? And suddenly they were oversubscribed. And the public bank doesn't have to invest anything. Right? It's just because they signaled this is a good project, everybody jumped on board. So the policy message really is that if they're well designed and equipped with the right mandates, green state investment banks can actually crowd in private capital while avoiding crowding out. We've seen a bit of crowding out. Sometimes they get out of the sector too slow, but generally there was much more crowding in. They have also very good leverage factors. If you see how much private capital they actually crowd into those projects, we also have a quantitative analysis on that. Now that's also a good, interesting policy tool. And by the way, um, there's also a bill in the US about a federal green investment bank in the US. And we're, we're, we're working with the advocacy to support this because we, at, at least our experience is really positive. Keep in mind that there's also very negative experience about public banks, um, especially in developing countries. If you think about Biandish, for instance, the biggest, um, I think one of the biggest development banks in the world, the Brazilian development bank, where there was a lot of corruption scandals recently and so on. So in institutional quality measure matters also here. Shouldn't local national banks be able to uh, uh, perform the same function? That is, if they're in leading sectors, yeah. in leading countries, yeah. they should have the information they can transfer it more yeah. readily than a national bank. Uh, why, why are these needed if you have multinational banks in the same sector? Right, so we also looked at multilateral development banks, um, World Bank, Asian Development, and so on. They also do this, but they have one big, big uh, downside compared to these guys. Innovation as such is not one of their mandates. And I mean, they, they, they do green their portfolios, but essentially they depend on what the government wants. They cannot tell the government, hey, we're going to finance this new technology that you don't want. I'm just thinking of multinational private banks. City ah, banks, yeah. Banks yeah, yeah, yeah. That operate in many different right. jurisdictions. Right. They have experience in right. leading areas yeah. like Germany. Mm -hmm. They should be able to transfer yep. that same experience to lagging areas. Right. We, we actually see those spillover effects of the, once they're familiar with those technologies. If you, for instance, Germany was really leading, Denmark and Germany really the, the you know, first movers in the sector in Europe. And then UK, for instance, stepped up. A lot of those projects are financed by German banks now. Also the Italians, it's quite interesting, um, Unicredit, the biggest Italian bank, was uh, heavily involved because the, Italy also had a really big boom at some point and they were financing a lot. Then the Italian market crashed they went abroad and financed uh, projects elsewhere because they had built up these teams. They had the in-house experience. So we do see these spillover effects, and that's also a good sign. Unfortunately, we don't have it in the Swiss banks, which are really global. Um, 
because they're they are not really big in that sector. We do have a lot of investment from Switzerland, but not with, well, not with the international banks. Yes. But that's good. I mean, you can, you can, if you work with the right banks in the beginning, then you can, as a public bank, you educate them, you make them familiar with the sector, you build up their expertise, then you can retract, and then they can actually do, the markets can play out, right? Okay, and then finally, politics. Um, and here I'm going to focus really on this feedback from technological change. So this part of the framework here. Um, and the big question is here how to increase policy ambition, right? And how to avoid backlash, I should also add. I'm going to talk about that also quickly. So first analysis I'm going to present quickly is on policy goals. And if you take any textbook on energy policy, it will tell you energy policy has three goals. One, make increase the security of supply, <coughs> reduce the cost of energy supply, and reduce the environmental burden. Now, we want to understand how important are those goals in the political debates. And was there a big shift in the goals to enable what you could call paradigmatic policy change? And um, we looked at Germany, therefore, which really introduced this most expensive ever renewable energy policy, which already cost them far over $120 billion by now. Um, that's the subsidies that are, that are um, paid to renewable energy uh, projects. By the way, new projects, they're all below. They're all at wholesale level, so at the moment there's no more subsidies, but we're all still paying those old um, projects. So we want to understand, um, does this change over time? Was there a big shift necessary to enable this policy change? And how partisan are the, these dimensions? And then we did what's called a um, discourse network analysis. So we looked over, I should not show this. We, should, we looked over 30 years from 1983 to 2013, 30 years of energy debates in the German par parliament. Um, and really the big debates, not the debates, how should we design this you know, policy, but really how should our energy system look like. Um, and then we did a network analysis, meaning you don't just count arguments or um, the number of times security was mentioned, but you actually do a network analysis between the actors, so the people, the parliamentarians who said something, and the arguments and how they are, those two networks are connected. And then you can measure the centrality of arguments. So it's a bit more sophisticated. And here's the result. So this is exactly the same dimension, same color coding, but I'm hiding something. We found a fourth big goal, and that's industrial policy goals. Jobs within the energy supply chain, especially within the energy technology supply chain. And look at how important that is, right? How central it is. This is the, the relative centrality of this goal, and it keeps being central throughout. So we're, while yes, this should not be energy policy, it's industrial policy, it's a different policy field, it really is important in the political debate and the discourse around energy and, and energy futures. Now if we look at renewable energies and those arguments, and th again, this is because of this paradigmatic policy change, this huge policy program for renewables, here are the parties, so this is the free market. We didn't have a, a far right party back then, unfortunately we have one now in parliament. Actually, Germany never had a party that said climate change is a hoax, now they do, um, unfortunately. But if you look at this, you really have this classic partisanship, right? These, these are the negative arguments on renewable energy, these are the positive arguments. And here you go from free market, corners, uh, uh, center right, center left, greens, and far left. And what you can see also is, yes, the left is more pro-renewable and the right is against on, on, on average. Um, but if you look at how those stacks are made up, that's quite interesting. So of course the right is saying, oh, this is too expensive, right, blue. And ah, it, it you know, compromises energy security. But they have a lot of positive arguments on jobs and you know, creating GDP. And that's actually more arguments than against that here. And here, the left wing really uh, builds on this argument a lot. Funnily also, the environment doesn't matter much in this debate. This is kind of, a, I don't know, probably it's just a, a no-brainer. Um, but what's interesting, if you look at all these arguments, the only one that's really the, in, in net, nonpartisan, except for this unimportant uh, environmental arguments, is actually this industrial policy dimension, energy industry arguments. So that, maybe it's not a surprise, right, that I think nine out of the 10 states with the highest wind 
generation capacity in the US are red states, right? Everybody likes jobs, everybody likes um, clean, uh, uh, low cost energy also. Um, so that's actually, I, I know that uh, Denise, you're doing a lot of work on, on co-benefits, right? That's a huge co-benefit, if you wish, of renewable energy. Um, a similar analysis where we really wanted to understand how do the coalitions around technologies change over time. So same period, last 30 years uh, in Germany, this time we coded not only those 808 pages of parliamentary debate, we also coded 3,900 statements um, made in a newspaper in Germany. So we got the archive and then we did a, again a discourse network analysis and now you're going to see a network actually. And we're also going to do process tracing of understanding feedback mechanisms, why they changed their position. So really coding these statements. And what you see here is three periods, three legislative periods. Um, the first one is, and I have to look, 83 to 87. And you can see that the renewable energy coalition here, this green one, is really, really small and not super well connected, where there's a lot of connection between the nuclear and um, the fossil fuel coalition here. Then that changes in 1998 to 2002. You already see this is growing rapidly. They are kind of splitting apart, especially this nuclear from, from um, fossil. And there's quite interesting some overlaps between nuclear and, and renewable now. And then 2009 to 13, this has become the, the, the most central coalition um, um, by far. Now, some of the, a summary of the feedback mechanisms that we've seen, and a key, I mean, the key argument is, so here there was a debate about coal versus nuclear. That was really the big debate in the 80s. In this period, remember what happened, 1986? Chernobyl, right? It's my, one of my earliest childhood memories, because um, I couldn't play outside for three weeks. Um, and the, um, so that was this big debate, and there was always this, oh, we have to phase out nuclear, we have to replace it by coal. That was the big argument. But then uh, they introduced renewable energy policy here, and um, that just made this coalition so strong. Um, and here are some of these feedback mechanisms from the technological change that we've observed. Positive resource feedback mechanism. I, if you were, there's in this literature on, on policy feedbacks, there's these resource feedback mechanism and interpretive feedback mechanism. The resource feedback mechanism is really jobs and GDP created in these new technology supply chains. This was really important, uh, especially a lot of these jobs in the solar industry in Germany um, um, were in the east, where you know there was, after the reunification, there was a huge unemployment rate. Um, then there was a redistribution um, of um, funds to politically powerful constituents. One of the most important um, design elements of this policy was that farmers profited tremendously. There was actually a new word created in the German language, which is Energiewirt. So instead of farmer, it's like energy farmer. Right? Because you would just grow your corn for your bio, biogas plant and you would own wind farms and solar, solar farms on your land. And that was really important because it even the conservative party, which is the Farmers' Party also, was then one of their key constituents was suddenly for renewable energy. And that was really, really important to, to keep this, this feed-in tariff alive, despite the high cost. Then there was positive interpretive feedback mechanisms. Everybody had underestimated the cost reduction of the technology. Everybody saw these co-benefits, right, that they hadn't seen before, cleaner air, <laughs> for instance. And Another thing is that there were far less integration, grid integration issues than had been anticipated. A lot of people said, oh, this fluctuating electricity, it's going to mess up our grids. We're all going to have blackouts all the time. And that's not true. We haven't had a single blackout since then. And then there was a diminishing negative effect. And that was really the, the um, jobs that were lost in the nuclear and fossil-based industry. Siemens, for instance, the biggest German technology provider, they sold all of their nuclear and coal um, um, divisions, so that was less of, a, um, less of a negative feedback then. Now, finally, that's the last thing I'm going to talk about quickly, and that's um, work in progress, so I'm, I'm helpful for, for comments on, on that one. Um, how to avoid backlash. And now we're going to move, I talked a lot about Germany or, you know, the um, rest of the world. Now let's focus on the US. Um, and let's talk about presidential elections here. And um, call phase out. 
probably you're aware that coal is a very partisan issue here in, in this country. Um, so the Republican Party already um, under Obama had this campaign called Stop the War on Coal, Fire Obama, or Stop Obama's War on Coal. And then Trump really also jumped on that bandwagon. And then you probably remember this Trump digs coal and he's standing in his hard head and shoveling. And, right. So he was really like, I'm going to bring coal back, which of course he didn't uh, at all. And on the other hand, on the left, um, you had Hillary Clinton saying at a campaign, we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Um, and then she realized at this moment, oh, I should add something to that, but that was never then quoted again. And in her book, um, what happened, she actually um, says that was her biggest regret of the entire campaign. This sentence. Not, not the basket of deplorables, but this sentence. Um, now what we wanted to understand is, um, does technology decline, coal mining in that case, feed back into politics through voting? And then, of course, uh, was she actually right? <laughs> Should this be a biggest regret or not? Um, so what is, we look at the US, and there's this huge, massive coal decline from 20, 2011 onward, mostly driven by fracking, but also Clean, um, clean Air Act. Um, and what we do is a difference in difference analysis on county level. So here you see this massive decline. This is employees in coal mining. Um, and you see it's kind of going up. And then in 2011, it really crashed. And since then, it has only continued to crash. And we said, oh, this looks like almost like a, like a quasi-natural experiment. <laughs> um, suddenly, this, this massive shock. And interesting, we have elections right every four years. So here we have the first Obama election, we have the second, and then we have the, the Trump election. So what we did is we identified all coal counties that saw coal decline in that period. So those are the red counties here. So you see uh, Appalachia, and you see this western uh, coal basin, um, and a bit in between. And then we matched those counties to a control group. That's what you do in diff and diff. Um, so on eight variables, and these are the classic variables that help explain voting outcome, um, like share of white population, unemployment, income, educational level, and so on. Um, and then you have to find this parallel trend assumption, which is here confirmed. So the treated ones over time, this is the share of the Republicans or re Republican vote share, which went up, 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 up. And then suddenly, it's no longer overlapping. And these are exactly those two elections. So apparently, there's something going on. This is actually, if you compare the treated, so the counties with coal decline, to the control group, you see that there was no difference in these years. No, statistically, here we matched it. So. There was no statistical difference. And suddenly, you see the statistical difference, right? On average, 4% in the 2012 election. That's the second Obama election. And that goes up slightly through Trump. So you could say Hillary wasn't that, that right, actually, right? Because most of it had already happened before, you could argue. She didn't bring the, the guys back, but, but still. But um, what's also interesting is that this effect really only played out in the strongly treated counties, so the counties with massive coal decline. So we split the sample into those in, at, at the median and compared the you know, less with the more um, affected counties. And you can really see statistically significant differences only for the strongly treated, the stark red sample. Then what we also did is we wanted to understand whether there are spillovers from those treated counties, the counties with coal decline, to neighboring regions. So we also uh, looked at that, um, and we looked at 50 kilometers distance, 100 kilometer distance, and 150 kilometer distance around the center of each county, and included those counties. And there you can see that it's a bit hard to read, but in the 2012 election, only the treated counties were really statistically diff different from the control group. But then here, you actually find the spillover effect um, up to this 50 kilometer parameter. Right? So that might be a Trump effect. And keep in mind, there were some swing states in the sample. I, if I go back quickly, um, you have Pennsylvania, right? you have Ohio. And these, are, these are the classic swing states that uh, Trump won. And what's really also important is if you compare these, this effect, almost 6% on average, this is much, much more than 
jobs lost in coal mining. Right? And even if you include the families of the coal miners, it's still many, many more voters than just those people. So apparently it's not what's called egotropic voting, but it's sociotropic voting. So there is spillover effects to people who are not directly affected. Um, so again, the shift in votes exceeds the coal jobs lost. It extends beyond the affected voters and in, even into neighboring counties unaffected by coal decline. Ah, we only consider those counties if they were unaffected by coal decline, right? Um, otherwise, we would double count. And that the implications is just simply at looking at the numbers not enough. You also have to understand the geographical dimension. And we really need to better understand. I mean, this, this analysis cannot do this, but I think we need follow-up research to really understand the economic and cultural effects also of coal decline. Because I think it's more than just the economic effects. It also plays. We see this in Germany. We, we now have a phase out of coal, phase out policy till 2038. It's going to be phased out. But those regions with coal mining, they're not happy about this, at least one of them. They're really, my father was a coal mining, my granddad was a coal mining, I'm a coal, a coal miner, I'm a coal miner. Now I'm going to be a what? Right? Okay. So I'm almost at the end. From all of this, I think there's three key policy messages on a higher level, and I also put some examples how we try to communicate them. If, we have, if you have great ideas how to better communicate find research findings to policymakers, let me know. Um, so one is technologies differ, and that should be considered in innovation policy. Um, you should throw what, you should not throw the same policy, it's very different technology, but you should do technology smart policy design. Now here's an example where we actually informed the European debate and actually I think we're quite successful. Um, then on the research on energy finance, I think public finance can help bridge this financial what's called valley of death, right? Which what I described before, faced by many new technologies and actually help to crowd in private capital. So that's a new policy tool for instance, like green um, investment banks. And then on our research and politics, I think to overcome opposition to climate change mitigation, really consider the industrial policy arguments, even though they're not in your textbook on energy policy. <laughs> um, they are definitely in the debates. And then if it's hard to get policy off the ground, try some small things like the Germans did. They actually had a 1,000 rooftop program, then it was extended to 100,000 rooftops, you know, then an industry started forming and so on. And finally, it was the biggest subsidy program for renewables that really pulled this entire industry globally out of its niche. Um, right, so you can induce some tech change that then creates positive feedbacks and enables you to you know, ratchet up your, your policy. And with that, I uh, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to questions. Great talk, why don't you go ahead and take your yeah. question. Yes, please, gentlemen in the purple shirt. Um, yes, we definitely see this positive effect. As I said, the farmers, for instance, they were really um, bought into this policy. Um, the problem is, of, of, I think, often a geographical mismatch and also agent. I mean, it's very different actors. Um, so it's, I think it's going to be really important to create jobs in the location where you phase out coal and, and offer a, a realistic um, alternative job opportunity. Uh, there was programs in, the Appal in, in Appalachia about coding for miners or something. It was, co was a complete disaster. And I mean, that, I mean, if you think about it, two seconds, you, you, you could have you uh, seen this coming, right? But there could be other jobs. We're actually working now on a, on a project where we're trying to under understand the capabilities needed in different jobs that match very well the capabilities of those people that would be, would be losing their jobs so that you can, of course, through government intervention, um, then try to create industries in that regions that, so that this transition is more or less smooth. But the, I think you also have to take care of the cultural aspect. So in Germany for hard coal, for instance, that was really a big thing. That we faced that out a long time ago because it was just economically way too expensive. But we did it slowly and we had all this coal culture. We had coal museums and it was, you know, my mom, it's a very interesting story. My mom who's really an environmentalist and really, that's why I'm doing probably the stuff I'm doing, to be honest. But when they closed down the last hard coal mine in Germany two years ago, 
my mom cried because she's from that region, right? And it's really in her heart. They were singing this minor song and stuff. So it's really also these cultural aspects that we shouldn't underestimate. No. Yes, please. You didn't mention uh, at any point the chef that didn't make the property. Yeah. In your viewpoint, is that a significant uh, problem in terms of uh, transfer of technical, mm -hmm. technological expertise from the U.S. to the Far East or anywhere else? Um, <clears throat> so theft of intellectual property, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's that important in this in this industry. Um, if you look at, for instance, how China caught up in PV. It was not that they you know, just, just copied other PV cells and then just went away with it. It's just they bought German and Swiss equipment to produce on that. And that's totally legal, right? You can, you can buy equipment. So um, in terms of wind, it's a bit different because the test of knowledge is in the design and they tried to re-engineer that. But what, I mean, the, the firms, the wind, the Europeans were really leading in that, in that technology still are, I would say. Um, and they were smart. So all the technology that went to China that they built there was never the latest generation. So then China could only rebuild you know, old turbines and so on. Um, that's, that's my point on that. But generally, it's very hard to, I mean, that's one of the big market failures um, that some environmental economists don't consider, right? Appropriability of knowledge. And the patent system is not perfect for, the, for, for, for providing that appropriability. Um, so there will always be knowledge spillovers. And in a sense, that's also good because you want competitors to learn so that there is you know, um, continuous competition. Um, but that's why I think if, you, if I go back to the framework here, where is my last slide with the framework? Probably somewhere here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you just go from policy to environmental effects, just what's the effect of policy on emissions? And you, 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 you do not consider this technology, this artifact, and the industries and supply chains, you miss out a lot. You miss out all the jobs part, but you also miss out all the market failures around appropriability of knowledge. And the knowledge does not only come from R&D. That's often what people then say, ah, oh, then just R&D subsidies, that's it. No, the knowledge comes a lot from experimentation, and therefore um, these deployment policies are highly important. Yeah, just, just on that note, so you had that really nice graph with the uh, complexity of design yep. versus complexity of the process. And um, I was just wondering where electrolyzers fit on that. Are they both high, Ooh, yeah. high design, high process? We, have, we, 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 did, we did look into that because we had this project in Power to X, uh, Power to Gas or to product. Um, and the electrolyzers, they're... Uh, now I'm having a really hard time to remember where they were because we looked at the individual components of that. And, but they're rather, they're not too complex, but they're also not mass produced. So they're, it's all in relation to other technologies. It's definitely less complex than a wind turbine. And the manufacturing is definitely much less complex than a, than a uh, PV cell that I can tell. But I can, if, if, you, if you send me an email or follow up later, I can actually send you that report. Great. Oh. Bob. Oh. <laughs> no, no. One, one is, I, I, I'm trying to, with, with secular stagnation, uh, the good thing for climate change. What? With, with secular stagnation, the good thing for climate change. I always dislike it, uh, zero interest rates, very mm -hmm. low growth rates, uh, excess capital supply. That's what the financial uh, crisis is always talking about. But normally seen as negative. If your analysis indicates mm -hmm. that it would be positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we just published this paper. So we and I, I said, hey, if they go up again, renewables will be more expensive. On top of that, the um, empirical literature looking at the relationship between interest rates and fossil fuel prices, because these renewables have to compete with exist at least in Europe they have to compete with existing fleets, right? We have enough capacity. Um, and they have to kind of outcompete them um, uh, of the, uh, out of the market. Um, the problem is with higher interest rates, there is less of an incentive to keep resources underground. So actually, fossil fuel prices go down. So you have these two effects, and they both work in the same direction. So uh, probably my answer would be yes, it would be good if 
we have low interest rates. And there's a lot of economists who say it's not necessarily artificial, but it could be because of you know an aging society and so on that these interest rates will remain lower anyway. Yeah. What if we have time for one last question? Uh, I, just one more point before I forget, because the quantitative easing policy of the, the, the central bank, which essentially just bought corporate bonds and, and, and government bonds, sovereign bonds, that was often criticized um, because, remember, the polluting firms are typically balance sheet financing. They offer these bonds on the capital market, whereas the small project fund, they don't offer bonds on the capital market. So there you have this negative effect of quantitative easing, at least, on, um, on renewable energy. And there's actually people, economists who, macroeconomists who call for green quantitative easing, where you, it's, it's very debated because do you want to mix monetary policy with climate policy? But they argue the problem is so big, climate change is so big, that actually we should um, step out of this comfort zone where you know, monetary policy is just for stable uh, inflation and deflation. But there's a huge debate on that. Uh, Lagarde, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the entire European Union, also, also the European Investment Bank, is supposed to become the European Climate Bank. So they're really, going, they're really um, pushing ahead. Of course it does, but the big difference between fossil fuel technology, especially if you look at gas and renewables is, renewables are capex intensive, all, all the costs are in the capital up front, and for gas all the costs are in the fuel essentially. I mean after a couple of years you pay much more for your fuel already than you paid for the plant. And if the fuel then gets cheaper, that is essentially um, affects your profitability or your, your competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis renewables where all the, all the costs are up front. We can, we can squeeze in one last question. Um, your, your comment about real, uh, renewable energy seems at private banks being able to do sort of yep. international learning. So what ways could you accelerate that maybe by pairing with uh, public, public firms as well? That's, that's a very good question. So you want, you want those spillovers to, to or these, this knowledge to spill over fast internationally, right? And um, what's interesting, first of all, what we have observed is um, that um, these banks inform each other, the public banks inform each other in the first place. So they, act, they actually have networks to share best practices and learning because they're not really in competition. Um, so the first thing the Green Investment Bank, when it was founded, did, they flew to Germany and asked those more experienced public investment bankers uh, in the, uh, at the KFW, how do you do this, da, 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 can you help us, and so on. And then... Um, um, on the other hand, you do have an issue because it's not the mandate of KFW or the GIB to educate, you know, commercial banks in, say, the U.S. It's not, at least it's not in their mandates. It could be written in those mandates, but it's, at, at the moment it's not. Um, there, I think, at the moment, the, the international market, the financial market, where you have a lot of international banks could, could play out. Um, on the other hand, what was very interesting for smaller, more decentralized projects was um, they channeled their money through decentral banks in Germany, which was super uh, effective. So if the, 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 the structure of the banking sector matters a lot too. And if you're more interested in decentralized projects, then you go through these decentralized banks, like local credit unions, they're often called here, right? Um, which really know the local conditions and so on, but that actually speaks then against international spillover. So there's a bit of a trade-off there, on this, at least on this decentral side. Yeah. Accelerate yep. Of right. Financial mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I'm New research to... project. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you for a fantastically insightful, relatively optimistic talk. <laughs> I'd also like to um, remind people that the Anlinger Center has its annual meeting this Friday. It's open to everyone, and you're welcome and encouraged to come. And thank you so much. Thanks for your great questions, yeah. also. Yep. Thank you.